This is the Xbox Series X, Microsoft's brand new console and its flagship in the battle of next generation gaming systems. Its release is just days apart from its chief rival, the Sony PlayStation 5, and brings features we've never associated with a console before, like 8K resolution support and hardware accelerated ray tracing, along with some we would expect, like it being a black box and running Pac-Man more than adequately. The Series X represents the future of Microsoft's Play for Your Living Room, and my colleague Jason Schreier's got a full review prepared separately to help you determine if that's a future you want. But the Series X arrives almost 20 years after the first Xbox was shown off, and boy have things come a long way. So let's take a look at the evolution of the Xbox, starting with the only model I couldn't get in front of me thanks to a certain pandemic lockdown, the original Xbox. Microsoft's relationship with numbers has always been ambiguous. The Xbox One, for instance, was not the first Xbox, having been released after the Xbox 360, which itself was not the 360th Xbox. Released in 2001, the original Xbox arrived on the scene right as Sega bowed out of the console industry after its technically brilliant but ill-fated Dreamcast succumbed to the popularity of Sony's powerful PlayStation 2 and Nintendo's family-friendly and accessible GameCube. GameCube. But Microsoft's pitch was strategically different to both. Unlike the PlayStation and GameCube, which were built with proprietary and unfamiliar hardware, the Xbox was basically just a PC. Its processor came from Intel, its graphics from Nvidia, it had a hard drive and internet connectivity as standard, and its operating system was based on Windows. So there was a very low bar for developers to turn their PC coding knowledge into console expertise. That's actually exactly what happened with the best-selling Halo series, which was originally developed for PC and, believe it or not, Apple's Macintosh, before becoming a franchise synonymous with Xbox. The first Xbox really was an answer to the question, how do I easily bring a gaming PC into my living room? The problem was that not many people were asking that question at the time because they'd all bought PlayStations or GameCubes. But those who had asked it embraced the Xbox, which was more powerful, more connected, and more future-facing, frankly, than anything it competed with at the time. Things like having an Xbox Live subscription for multiplayer battles, downloadable content, and even just friends lists, they all originated on that first Xbox. While it never outsold its competitors, it proved Microsoft was onto something. There was a market for a new type of console in the living room, as long as it was easy to use, had great games, and offered something that no one could get any other way. Fast forward to 2005 and Microsoft took its fight with Sony to a new level. The Xbox 360, released at the end of that year, came out a full year before the PlayStation 3 and cost significantly less than Sony's console would. The PS3 would bring several massive features the 360 didn't. Most importantly, a built-in Blu-ray drive that could play HD video content, whereas Microsoft's console only had a DVD drive by default. But man, what the 360 had over the end of its life PlayStation 2 was literally game-changing. A massively expanded Xbox Live service let you download games and movies and demos even for upcoming games. It had better multiplayer and social services. Plus, it outputted HD at the point consumers were able to buy an HD TV for the first time, but had no easy way to get any content for it. The Xbox 360 was, for many people, the first place they could get that high-def content, and as an upgrade from any earlier console, the graphical fidelity on offer by its games was light years ahead. That year's head start over Sony was crucial, and it helped attract developers and consumers alike to buy into the Xbox as a primary gaming platform. Microsoft and Sony's consoles sold well for a decade or more after this, but in the background, PCs were incrementally getting better graphics. Streaming rather than owning things got underway as a consumer trend. Digital stores like Steam were shifting how people expected to explore vast back catalogues of games. Microsoft needed to capture this, and it did so with its third Xbox, the deceptively named Xbox One. It was released in 2013 and wanted to be everything to everyone. Ah, that's where the name came from. It was a games console, a place for music and TV and movies, an exercise tool and dance tutor with a Kinect motion sensor that was carried over from the Xbox 360, and more besides. But what it did best was games. Microsoft now had a vast library of titles and would eventually make huge numbers of them playable on the Xbox One via download. It was also able to leverage its success at attracting developers to the Xbox 360 by launching with next-gen games from franchises like Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed, Battlefield, FIFA, 
What else was that? Zoo Tycoon, or as I like to call it, Giraffe Simulator. Now, later variations were released in increments to keep up to date with PC architecture. Most notably, the Xbox One X, which is this model here, brought Ultra HD 4K resolutions to Microsoft's console world. And as the Xbox 360 did with HD, it let people upgrade their home cinema systems to include the best visual fidelity available on the market at that point, when it was not that easy to do otherwise. It was also around this time Microsoft started making games available on PC and Xbox purchasable as single packages, meaning if you own, say, Forza Motorsport 7 on PC, you also owned it on Xbox. It was an extension of some of the company's earliest thinking about how to bring a PC into the living room. And that thinking feels more fully realized today with the Xbox Series X. It's more powerful than many gaming PCs, but it's as easy to use as a console should be. And it's got a catalog of games spanning two decades from original Xbox releases through 360 and Xbox One titles. And it's still expandable with things like Xbox Live and Microsoft's Game Pass subscription service, as well as third party services like Netflix and Disney Plus, and actually for the first time, Apple TV. Sony has, of course, plenty of compelling reasons to choose a PlayStation 5 instead, of course, and I'll be coming to that company's history in another video. But I hope this highly condensed summary of two decades of Xbox innovation has at least helped illustrate how the Series X isn't just the product of Microsoft's console making experience, but a fitting answer to the original question, how can we easily bring what's best about a gaming PC into a living room? For Quick Take in London, I'm Nate Langson.